one of the policies of the Department of Education this year and also for Australia. There has been a lot of work done both in New South Wales and Australia this year in order to encourage an attitude towards racial tolerance and racial understanding. Amondo is a Negro, but just not an American Negro. If I remember correctly, and it will give you some of his background, he is born in Germany. African Negro father and a Spanish mother. And he will show you some of the problems in living in his early life between three cultures. That is, an American Negro culture that we have understood from time to time. A German culture and then being able to converse with his mother and adopt a Spanish culture. And so he's in a very, very privileged position, I suppose, in some regard, although you may disagree when you hear of some of his experiences. <coughs> to understand what it is like to be of a different race to the main group of people among whom you're living. He is also an actor, <coughs> a singer, and has worked extensively with Diana Ross. So he's a very accomplished entertainer. And what he is doing at the moment is putting together something like a two hour one man show where he will sing, dance, entertain, but also get a message across. And if you were privileged to be part of year 9 and 10 on his previous visit. You would have been able to appreciate that. I won't say any more because I would think part of his appeal, and part of his skill, is to be able to introduce himself and to give you a very clear and quick understanding of some of the cross cultures that move in his life. You were all sitting here so quietly, I thought it was late. No, no, not late. I've taken the opportunity to give them a little briefing on your background and why you're interested in reminding you again. But I'll leave it there. You might give them a more detailed Demonstration. Done. Leave it to you, Martha. Good uh, afternoon. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Now, I, I discovered last time that I was here. I usually don't like doing this because I don't like separating myself <coughs> from from you. But I discovered that if I go up on the stage, I can actually see the people in the back row a lot better and. Uh, uh, it just creates for, for better eye dynamics. So if you don't mind, I will, I will take my posse up here now. <laughs> my name is Armando Hurley. We have all met at one point or another, I'm sure. If you listen to the radio, if you watch television, if you see ads uh, on the side of highways, then perhaps you've heard something like, uh, Cupid, draw back your bow and let your arrow go straight to my lover's heart for me. Not my 
much left, but I got it. <laughs> no, just worry about it. What, what's up there is staying there for another week. Uh, or maybe uh, I convinced your parents to use uh, one of the uh, phone carriers, like Optus, at the end of the Optus ad, I, I go, oh yeah. heavy jobs to do, you know, like they asked me to disguise my voice so that I don't sound exactly the same every time you hear me, so I would do things like, uh, I did a Sheba cat food commercial, and what I had to do was I had to go, lean on me, when you feel down, I'll be the one, somebody to me. And what happened was, there was supposed to be a lady to show up who was going to do the voiceover, because there's a lady in the, in the ad, right? <coughs> and she was late. So they said, do me a favor, just put a sketch on it. But you and I go great. So I sang the, lean on. She <laughs> But I had a good, I thought it was very funny. So I went home, right? And about a week or two later, suddenly uh, I, I hear in the background, lean on me. I said, oh, my new commercial's on. I go running to the room and I check it out. And I'm watching with my friends and they say, gee, it sounds really great. And I say, yeah, it sounds great. And all of a sudden, at the very end of you hear this, she the cat. It sounds really <laughs> sweet. <laughs> That's my voice. <laughs> I thought they were going to fix that. And I called, the, I called the guy up and I said, hello, listen, listen, I just saw the ad. He goes, I know, isn't it great? Incidentally, we're sending you the money for the voiceover. And I said, don't tell me that. That's me. What's your name?
My mother is Mexican American Indian. They come from my mother comes from Nogales, which is right on the Arizona, United States, Arizona, Mexico border. Now do me a favor, guys. Hey, 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 hey. Don't do that to me. Because I'll call you out in five seconds. Don't talk when I'm talking. Otherwise you can come up and talk and I'll listen. Because I'm so nosy, I gotta know what you're talking about. I cannot stand people talking and I not know what you're saying. Because you could be saying my flies open or something. <laughs> So I get all, all nervous and stuff, so don't be talking when I'm talking. Now, my mother was Mexican-American Indian, and they're Hopi Indians, so they were cliff dwellers. They lived up in cliffs, and they had these ladders that came up to the top of the cliff. And the idea behind it was their safety zone, so that if the cowboys were coming, or other Indians, they would pull their ladder up, they put it inside, inside the uh, uh, mountain, and uh, everybody, these cowboys and Indians, they can go by all the time going bang, 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 right? And the Indians would be inside having a cup of tea. <laughs> and they have a nice drink. And every year and there, one of them would go out and look down and go, they're still down there. <laughs> well, we'll check tomorrow. And then go to bed, you know? They got running water, they got everything in there. You know, these fools are out there freezing to death around the campfire. Well, eventually they'd go away and they'd lower the ladders and they'd go down and they'd continue on their way and as happy as, as a bee or doing their hunting and what have you. My father's side of the family comes <coughs> from Africa. And one day uh, in the tribe that my family comes from, a ship pulled in. They came into the village. They raped, destroyed, burned, and took anything of value, including human beings about your age, and put them on boats and shipped them to America, where they were sold on blocks as, as you would sell a cow or sheep or what have you. My great-great-grandfather bought our freedom back two blocks from where they were sold in Virginia. And that is uh, my father's side of the family. My father met my mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was going to uh, a lovely school, so I, I had a really good life. My mother, uh, my mother wanted me to always go to Catholic boarding schools, and so I went to these lovely Catholic schools, and they're very nice. But my father, who was Baptist, insisted that at least once a month I go to a Baptist church just so I can have a cultural exchange. So, my dad took me down. This is my first experience at a Baptist <coughs> church. I went down there, and it was like, check it out, ladies. When you go to a Baptist church, you got to be looking good. You know what I'm saying? you got to have your hat, your gloves, and your, your, your purse, and your matching outfit. And everybody arrives 20 minutes early to come into the church, because, you know, you got to work it when you come in. You don't just walk in and sit down and, you know, forget it. you got to work it. <laughs> now, if the whole congregation is doing that, you know it's going to take a long time to get there, don't they? So they arrive a half hour early. And brothers, brothers, brothers look good too. Brothers had on the ties and the jackets, you know what I'm saying. And they look good, they had that walk. <laughs> and they come into church and then they have to do the same thing. They pose it. <laughs> and they do the other side. <laughs> well, you got 40 guys coming in. That takes a while, too. So everybody arrives early to get into the church. Finally, they all get into the church. I met with my auntie. My auntie's a very, very big woman. And she's sitting next to me. She keeps patting me on the legs. Hey. And, and I'm going, how are you, baby? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's fine. So suddenly, the choir comes out, three rows, and they're sitting there going, <laughs> and everybody in the audience goes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good night. Here comes a preacher, here comes a preacher. <laughs> My brothers, my sisters. My brothers and my sisters. <laughs> my sisters and my brothers. And someone said, yes! And I'm sitting there saying, well, they said that. You know. It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? And someone goes, mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, uh. 
sliding down in my chair just a little bit going, this is weird. And my, and my, and my auntie goes, oh, it's beautiful. And, I'm like, and I wanted to go, shh. <laughs> You know, it was a little embarrassing. I mean, everyone's talking in church, and man's trying to say something. And, there, and then people in the back go, ooh, 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 and he's going, yeah, and everyone's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, wait a minute, I'm just going to talk. So anyway, they go through this whole thing, and they're starting to get going, and all of a sudden, the choir, the choir breaks into the, yeah, and Jesus got me. Elephant style, 
And we get to the next gate, and we stand there. Because we're military kids, we almost kind of line up. You know, it's like dress rehearsal. It's like uh, dressing up. It's like two, three, hop. <laughs> Bring it in. Push it up. Over the side. Over the side. Up. <laughs> so here we are. We're at the gate. We're just waiting. We're very relaxed. And this guy's coming up, the sergeant with his little daughter. And they walk up. And now we're just kind of waiting, watching the world go by. And the little girl says, look at it, there's a nigga. And everybody turned and looked at me. And I backed up. And I looked down. And I said, there's a nigga on me. <laughs> So I knew my, maybe, maybe there were lots of hookers on there. <laughs> lots of niggers all over me or something like that. And it wasn't nice for her to point out the fact that I had a nigger on there. <laughs> but then my father, who was a colonel, walked over to this guy. And he had a conversation with him. They got along really well, I could tell. Because my father kept going, oh, no, no. The guy kept going, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I knew they liked each other. <laughs> and they turned around and grabbed his daughter. And off they went in kind of like a hut. And apparently, apparently my father just chewed him from one side to the other about his child's behavior in public. Uh, I don't think the guy was quite ready for a colonel to come up and do that, particularly when they were a child colonel. <laughs> but anyway, that's what happened. So that was kind of like my, my, one of my first experiences with racism because when I was in Europe, I never knew that I was different from anybody else. I mean, I wore later hose. I look good, my lady. <laughs> I had a white shirt, you know, with a little, little clubby thing that comes over the shoulders with a little ear in the front like this. <laughs> I was good. I looked good. I had a hat with a plume on it, and I was looking for Heidi. I used to go, you're lying. I had life was wonderful. I didn't know I was good. Although every year in there someone would shake my hand and they'd rub my hand like this. And then they take the hand away and then they go. And I say, it's called me out. It doesn't come off. And they go, oh, I know that. Do you think I don't know that? And I said, yeah, of course you don't know. And they go, I know that, see? <laughs> so other than that, I really didn't know any better until I had that, had that nigger all over my body. <laughs> And we went out to, we flew out to California. Now in California, I went to a fantastic school, El Cerrito High School. And at this school, everyone really got along fairly well. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a good high school full of good, solid people, and I was, and I was happy to be, proud, to be part of it. I had brothers in front of me that were all American football, baseball, that kind of stuff. So they really blazed the way for me. When I came sliding through, it was like I was accepted. And that, was, that was pretty nice. And I was working for the school newspaper. I was in my senior year, and the great thing about working for the school newspaper is that you don't, uh, you don't have to go to class on certain days. You see. They'd say, go over there and write a story. I said, right. And off I go. <coughs> this time the circus was in town. Ringling Brothers Barn and Baby Circus, the greatest show on earth. They sent me down to write an article on it. I said, that's great. Out of school I go. Down to the circus I go. I arrived down there, got my pad, my pencil. Um, I felt like Clark Kent. <laughs> and there I was. And I sit there and I kept going there. Hi, I'm Armando. Pardon me, I, I'm Armando. Hello, I'm a... I, I... Excuse me, I'm yeah, Stand over here. Okay. okay. So I stood over here and I waited. And I waited, because I obviously don't know who I am. From El Cerrito High School. Forget the New York Times. Forget the Sydney Morning Herald. We're talking El Cerrito High School. <laughs> so I'm leaning on this thing. Suddenly, 
Suddenly this guy comes up and says, I want you to walk towards me as slowly as you can. Now I'm already in my cash position. And I go, okay. And I go, Circus, and that's exactly what I did. 
I packed my suitcase and I snuck down the stairs, <coughs> right across the staircase, you know the one that your parents were going to squeeze? Just so that when you're going down the stairs, they can go, where are you going? <laughs> uh, to the bathroom. There's no toilet downstairs. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and of course, if that doesn't get you, they leave the door squeaky at the front, right? So I make across that one. I get down to the front door, past the dog who's wagging the tail and happy to see me at an ungodly hour of the morning when you keep going, shh, shh. And they think you're playing. Oh, I, I, I. <laughs> and you finally get the door, and you get the door open, and you get to that squeaky point, and you can only open it so much because then you get the big squeak, the one that, the, the one that, uh, the one that where you hear the voice. Who said you could go out? I just get the newspaper at four in the morning. <laughs> so you have to be very cool. So I just got open just enough, and I took the first suitcase and I slid it out the door. Got the second one, slid out the door, and then I slid out the door, and I closed the door. I'm standing there. I'm nervous. I'm committed. I took a bus ride from San Francisco to Miami. That's the same thing as going from Barrow to Perth on a bus. That's what I learned. <laughs> See, y'all already know that. I didn't know that. Day one. Day four. Day six. And you get off the bus, and you know what? When you get off the bus, you kind of walk around like this. Oh, it was terrible. But I finally get down there and I said, look, I better call my mom. I better call my dad. I better let them know what's happening. I call them up and I go, look, I'm dad at Common College. My, my, my dad says, I know where you are. My dad is regional representative for health, education, and welfare for Western United States. Every time I took money out of my bank account, this little light would go bloop, and he'd go, oh, there he goes. Oh, he's in Texas. Oh, there he goes. Oh, there he goes. My dad knew where I was and where I was going. He said, I'm going to give you three months, I want you to work this out, and you are coming back home, you are going to university, you are, going, you are, you are, you are. And I kept going, okay, Dad, okay, Dad, I hung up the phone, I don't do what I want to do. <laughs> Who do you think you're talking to? See, I can do that when I'm off the phone. <laughs> so I went, all right. So, because I speak German, as I told you before, the international language for circus is English. So a lot of people from the Iron Curtain countries couldn't speak English, so I taught them English while they German. In return, they would teach me things, like walking the high wall. I walked 45 feet in the air without a safety net. Because it never occurred to me that I could get hurt. Because I, the way I figure it, if old, older people get up on it and they fall down, they just splatter all over the floor. <coughs> But if younger people fall off the wire, you land and you go, gee, that was high work. <laughs> so it never occurred to me that I could hurt myself or anything like that. So I'm going to have the best time. You know, I thought, I'm fantastic. Trapeze, single trapeze. It was great to get this cape. They get this cape. And they put the spotlight on it. They go, ladies and gentlemen, the great Armando. And the lights would shift, shift over to me again. I didn't want to go up. I'm so busy posing. You know? <laughs> Every time I see one of the, one of the girls, I have to like. You know, to the guys that he'd come up right next to me. If you don't get up, I'm gonna kick you. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm take you up. So I'm getting on. This is happening really good, and I'm sitting there in rehearsal with everybody else. And all of a sudden, this person comes in and says, "Mr. Fell wants to see you." That would be the same thing as the headmaster, as someone coming in and saying, while we're all sitting here, the lady said, the headmaster wants to see you right now. Right? And of course, everybody in the whole room goes, Well, that's how I felt. And I was like, ooh, right? And so I kind of went, and I went down to the office, and the secretary was there, and I walked in, and she says, ah! He's waiting for you. I mean, he made my heart run even faster. And I walk in, and there's a chair in his desk sitting there, and he has his back to me in the swivel chair, and he's on the telephone. And I, and I sit down, and here's this big swivel chair, and he's going, Yeah! Well, I don't care! If you don't like the way I do business, you're fired! Back! <laughs> and I went, who are you? I'm a, I'm a, I'm 
Mondo Hurley, I don't have one. Oh, yes, Mondo Hurley. Hmm. I understand you learned how to do the da 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 I said, yes, yes, I did. He says, good. You want to utilize all that in the show this year. So I'm prepared to offer you a contract of, say, $58,000. What do you think of that? And my negotiating skills, which are really fierce and powerful, I went, yeah! <laughs> so that ended the negotiation period, and we were right on to it. He says, good, well, we'll get the contract all fixed up, and this, that, and the other. And great. I walked out of the place, and I went, yes, yes, $58,000, 18 years old, and I'm making $58,000. It was burning a hole in my pocket. My wallet kept jumping out saying, spin me, spin me, spin me. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to buy everything, $58,000. I could buy half the world, maybe a quarter of the world like that, you know. I mean, it was just happening for me. And as I'm thinking about, what am I going to buy? What am I going to buy? Suddenly this voice comes into my head. Invest your money wisely. Money does not grow on trees. Have we heard this? Yes. It's my dad, right? It was, it was almost like, I don't know where my dad's head goes. Invest your money! He pulls out and goes, get out! You know? So I'm going, okay, I better do the right thing here. I better really use my brain on this one. So I thought about it. I thought about it. And I bought a truck. <laughs> With smoke windows <laughs> and the loudest stereo you've ever heard in your life. You could hear me two blocks away. <laughs> Yo, well, my brother, go and tell you what, because the people in the house are going to party your dad, go with the youth and the home and the brothers out there. I got it. Oh, man, that's fantastic. <laughs> Almost blood came out of my ears, it was that loud, you know? What I mean? <laughs> and the great thing is, you pull up to, you pull up to a light. And, and there's, there's, old, there's old Miss Perkins, you know Miss Perkins? Everybody's got a Miss Perkins in the town. You know Miss Perkins, she's driving you home, right? And all of a sudden, you pull up next to her and she'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and then, and then, everybody else had 25-foot caravans. I had a 33-foot caravan <laughs> with smoke windows. <laughs> and it said, A-H. Armando Hurley. And on the back of the truck it said A-H. So if they got separated, they could find each other. <laughs> now we're down in Nashville, Tennessee now. We're off on the road. I'm starting to develop a role here. I'm starting to understand what I need to do. We're in Nashville, Tennessee. We didn't like Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee was a country town, you know, stuff like uh, country music comes from this. My dog died, my shoes don't fit, and my toes are real sore. <laughs> I was out of there. Forget that stuff. You know, they were pretty yelling or nothing, you know? So, we had a Sunday show, we had two days off. And we decided that if we, the minute the show closed, if we've already packed up our trailer and stuff and we're ready to rock, then all we have to do is do it and get out of there. We drive all through the night, get in the next morning, sleep for about four or five hours, get up and go see a movie, have a light dinner, have a go, go, to, go to bed again, and then have a whole day off to do anything we want, museum, whatever. That would be, it's like luxury for us. So I said, yeah, what a great idea. So off we go, me and my three friends, we're on the highway, we're driving off on the thing. It's now we've done McDonald's, we've done uh, 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 Crap in the Sack, or the Jack in the Box. Uh, it's called Burger King today. It's still Crap in the Sack. Uh, and, uh, you know, and all the rest of the garbage food that we could possibly put into our system, we did. And now it's like 11.30 at night, and we're really hungry again. And uh, my friends come onto the CD, right? And on the CD, it's like we had the best time. We talked to each other. Oh, I got you there, big buddy. Oh, yo, there, big buddy. Uh, I got you there, big buddy. Uh, big buddy, big buddy. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. <laughs> and every here and there, you take your hand off the button and you hear one of the truckies say, Shut up! <laughs> and I go, Roger there, big buddy. <laughs> Good, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so anyway, we saw this sign. This 
said crawfish. Crawfish. Crawfish are like Belmain ducks. They're sitting there on this, on, on this poster with strips of paper rolling down. It was yellow. They looked like butter oozing in the wind. They look good. <laughs> and I said, how about that play? And this is like two before that sign. They go, nah. I said, how about that play? Nah. And we all saw the crawfish and said, how about that play? Yeah. <laughs> so we pull into this parking area, maybe about twice the size of the gym here, and we line up the trailers like in a row, so people, but sides in a row, so people could see them. Mine was on the outside. <laughs> with a smile on And exactly like that. And they had already gone in, because they know that I always take my time getting out, because I have to like dust off the window. You know, <laughs> make sure that, you know, when people drive by, they're seeing my trailer for the first time. I must take that impression. So I go running into the restaurant after them. And I go running, there are probably many people sitting here in this restaurant. I go running in. And just as I walked in, the whole place, which was talking very loud, suddenly went silent. And everybody is staring at me. Well, I did the same thing any of you would do. <laughs> I thought they were trying to warn me. There's someone behind. I was all ready, you know? Tear them up. Tear them up. So, and then I realized, there was no one behind me. They're still staring at me. And then I worked it out. Because I'm so damn good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to kind of walk in the room. Hello, how are you? Hello! <laughs> you know, it was all feeling pretty good for me. But the closer I got to my table, the more I realized that that's really not what's going on at all. That there's like bad vibes going on. Place. And I said, oh, I'm not buying into this. I'm not buying into this stuff. I mean, my friends, we're going to eat some crawfish. We're going to be out of here. They keep the bad, the bad vibes for the next customers. We're taking home with them as a doggy pack, you know? <laughs> so we're sitting down there, and the waitress walks up, and she walks up to my friend and says, what would you like? And he says, I'd like a crawfish. Crawfish you may have. And what would you like? Hamburger and chips. Oh, we're going to give you some extra chips. You're so good looking. And what would you like? Steak. We're going to give you some steak too, baby. And she turns to walk off, and I go, excuse me, excuse me. And I'll never forget this. Check this out. <laughs> and she had the worst breath, too. <laughs> what? I go, what? I'd like to order something to eat, please. I was polite, but four. What? I said, I'll have the crawfish. We're out. Now I'm starting to order. She's going. I said, how about a hammer? We're out. What about a stick? We're out. I'm going, damn, they're out of everything. Four seconds, they're out of everything. But I knew she was playing with me. I said, OK, I'm an intelligent young man. Let's think about this. I'm going to have <coughs> melted cheese and tomato sandwich, please, don't tell us. And she was so pissed off. <laughs> she wrote down, "What did And she wrote it so hard that it cut into four different pages. I thought I was going to get four sandwiches. <laughs> and off she goes in a huff. My God! I turn back to my friend right away. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> so she comes back with the food. She comes up to my friend and says, There's your crop, there's your crop. There's your hamburger and chips, you such a good look. Here you go, there's your steak, baby. You're a good looking too. And takes two steps back, takes my sandwich, and frisbees it onto my plate. <laughs> And this sandwich flies and goes boom right onto the table and slides up next to me. Well, I'm too cool. I will not be upset. I would give her the pleasure. I would boil it, you know. And I pull the sandwich forward and I go to adjust the top of the sandwich. And there's a, you know what? There's a hair sticking out on the side of it. I hate that. <laughs> Don't they wear hair nets back there or something? You know, I'm not supposed to have the hair in the bottom. And stuff. You know, I got this hair. I'm not going to make a big thing. I'm just going to pull the hair out, throw it away, just eat and get done. 
I got a pillow thing and it wouldn't move. So I took the top of the sandwich off and looked. They had taken a cockroach and squished it into my cheek. And then they'd taken dead flies off of a dead fly strip and they rubbed it into the sandwich. Now, I'm not going to eat any dead bugger you. Because whoever that was said, yes, I'm going to get a bugger give it to you. Well, I pushed it aside. So then this man comes up, he bumps into me and says, you got a problem my sister's cooking? I said, if you call this cooking, I don't. <laughs> it was kind of like a refrigerator place. <laughs> no, fridge is better looking. <laughs> and I looked around and realized that most of the people who were in the restaurant had now gone. And in a place where all these uh, not very happy looking people who spent a lot of time with a knife in hand cleaning their thumb to get their fingernails going. Which reminds me, I have to be careful where I step in. But they're all spitting on the floor up here. So we realize that there's a problem here. We go, look, guys, this is what we're going to do. We've got to get out of here. We've got to choose our time. Everybody eats. So I always start to eat. And I took the top off my side. I took some ketchup. <laughs> Salt, pepper. <laughs> put it down. I put the top back on the sandwich and I, and I thought about this. I said, okay. Revenge will be mine. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat the sandwich. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw up on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I picked up that sandwich, and I took a bite out of it, and I started chewing it, and it went, whoa, 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 hey, 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 whoa, 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 hey, 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 maybe yes, maybe no. And I suddenly realized I may not make the front door on this one. This could be a return to cinder oh. immediately. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, ooh, ooh. Uh, My friend said, let's just get out of here, everybody. Let's just all go now. So they go pay the bill. Two of them go pay the bill. Two of us are going to go outside. We get up to leave. My friend says, I have to go to the toilet. I said, now? He says, well, you got to go. you got to go. I said, okay, man, go to the toilet. I'm going to go out and I'll be in the truck. And you guys get there, we're out of here. So I go flying out the front door, and I walk out the front door, and standing in front of me are five guys with baseball bats. So this is a stupid little nigger who doesn't know that he doesn't eat in a white man's house. And I went, oh. I'm just back in. And I turn to go back in, and the two guys grabbed me and lifted me off the ground. And the guy came up, and with all of his strength, he kicked me right between the legs. They dropped me to the ground, and I rolled over like this, and they proceeded to beat and beat and beat and beat and beat and beat and beat. And I begged, and I screamed, and I said, stop, please, stop. And they said, the little nigger is begging. For that, you get fat. And they kept hitting me harder and harder. And one of, one of the guys said, hey, stop, you're going to kill him. And I looked at him and said, that's the idea. The pain was so bad that my brain switched off. I didn't feel any more pain. And every time they take a little extra swing into me, my body would react that I would not feel the pain. And the guy said, I got a better idea. And I was lying on, on the gravel, and I could hear his feet. And he walked across the gravel, and I heard a truck door open. And he came back with a can of petrol. And he undid the top. And he proceeded to pour the petrol all over my body. And I realized <coughs> that 
they were going to like me. Because they probably would think it would be funny if they saw me running around the parking lot screaming on fire. And as I waited, the liquid was running down my body. It ran down the side of my face. And as it ran down the side of my face, I suddenly realized that it was not petrol at all, but it was alcohol. And what their plan was, was to liquor me up, take me to the side of the road, and throw me in front of a semi-truck. The semi-truck would hit me. I'd splatter all over the place, and that would be the end of it. Because you know how it is. You know how niggas are. You give them a drink, they all walk out in front of trucks. They do that every day. So then they grab me, and they drag me with my body across the gravel to the side of the road, and they went, one, two, three, and they threw me up into the air, and I landed onto the highway, and I looked up, and coming straight forward was a semi-truck, and I rolled over, and the truck went by. I say it missed me by that much. My friends say it missed me by that much, but it really doesn't matter. It was close enough. And I crawled. I crawled with every bit of strength that I had to the middle of the road, to the divider, where there was a post. And I held up for my life. Because I'm afraid to die. I was thinking about my family and that I would never see them again. And I hear this voice from the other side of the sky says, Oh, hurry up! Someone drag him out there! I want to get a beer! <coughs> and my life was worth nothing more than a can of beer. down the highway, it's a man named Alex Sebastian. He was in his van, and as he's coming down the road, he saw our trailers on the side. And he decided he'd pull in because he knew we'd stop for coffee. And as he pulled in, and he saw my friends being pinned down to the ground, and he just instinctively turned and looked, because everyone was facing this way, and he looked across the street, and he saw me in the middle of the road, holding shaking. And he just walked right across the street and he picked me up off the ground and he says, can you make car go? Now, I don't know what made me do this, but because I was teaching him English, I said, do you mean can I operate the motor vehicle? And he said, this is not time for English lesson. Can you make car go? I said, I make car go. And he walked me over and sat me down on the side by my truck. And at that moment, they started coming towards him, which let my friends up, who ran and also got into their truck. As Adam said, go for your trucks, and he ran and got into his van. The race was on. We were heading down the highway. We are doing 130 and 140 clicks down the highway with trailers swinging back and forth like this in the wind. And behind them, behind them is a, a ute, and they have sticks, and they have guns. And they're on the CD and they're saying, you're going to die. All of you are going to die. You're all going to die. We're going to kill every one of you. And they're shooting their gun and they're slamming it to the side of our car, to the side of our trailer. And just up there, 2K, 3K, is the state line. If we can make the state line in World War Involved in this is a police officer who was a friend of one of the guys who happened to be in the restaurant. They're all after us. Bullets are being shot into the trailer. We get to the other side, we just make the border with them slamming into the back of the trailers. And they did stop following us. 
And about 2K on to the other side, one of my friends came on the CB and he said, hey, let's pull down, there's a rest stop here. Let's make sure everybody's okay. And then all of a sudden you hear this voice go, yeah, all of this stuff. Well, I'm sorry, I'm so freaked out at this point. I'm not stopping. I have dual tanks on my truck. I'm going to drive until I am somewhere where people are civilized. And I drove and I drove and I drove and I drove and I held my hand and I didn't stop for anything. I held that steering wheel so tight as I went. And the sun came up in the morning and the truck started surging and I looked down and I realized that I was out of petrol. Both tanks were absolutely empty. I had no choice, I had to do something. I looked around and just there is a petrol station in the middle of a field where I could see people coming and going in every direction. And I pulled in there and a the guy comes up to me and he says, what happened to you with that accent? And I said, nothing. <laughs> Just fill it up. He kind of took back what he said, Ooh, that's a bit snotty, a little nasty. You're damn right I'm angry. And he went and put the nozzle in the back of the truck. And he went up to the, to the, to the office, which was painted black in the front. And he leans in, and he says something, and he leans out, and he looks at me. And he leans back in and he grabs something. And he puts it behind his back and he starts walking towards the truck. It was at that moment that I realized that he had a gun in his hand. And I can't believe that in eight hours, in only eight hours, now this man is going to shoot me. But you know what? I thought about I thought about starting the truck, but there was no petrol. He hadn't started filling it up yet. I looked around, there was nothing I could do, and all of a sudden I had this strong pride because you know what? I'm not going to give you the pleasure to watch me beg for my life. I had enough. If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die with dignity. And I raised my head up. I put my hands over my lap, and I closed my eyes, and I lowered my head, and I waited for that bullet to come. At least I know I will die with some kind of respect. And when nothing happened, I turned and I decided I'm going to look him right in the eyes, so when he blows me away, I want you to see my face. I want him to see my eyes. I don't want him to ever forget my face for as long as he lives. And I turned and I looked right into his eyes and he had his hand out like this. And he had a cloth that was wet. He said, wipe your face, your face is covered in blood. <laughs> and I looked into the rear view mirror and I suddenly realized that my face had been covered in blood, had dried and started shaking and falling off. And I looked down at my white t-shirt that was bright red. His wife came out and said, oh my God, what happened to you? Get on out, get on out. She went to open, open up the door and we fought for a moment on the door. And finally she says, now get on out of there. I was a nurse in World War I. I was a nurse in World War II. I was a nurse in World War III. And I figured two out of three. She said, now get on out of there. You're hurt. You need to go to a hospital. I said, I'm not going to a hospital. I'm not going to stop until I get to a place where I am safe. She opened the door, and I stepped out of the truck. And as I put my foot down onto the ground, blood ran down my pants leg down onto the ground <coughs> like oil from a car. And as I looked down to see this blood, 
I looked over to my left hand side, my right hand side, I'm really sorry, and there were two ribs sticking out of the side of my body that had been sticking out the entire night. It's amazing how wonderful your mind is. When you are in pain, your mind will shut that section off. <coughs> She said again, you have to go to the hospital. I said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going. They wrapped me up the best they could. They put me into, uh, they cleaned up my truck and stuff, sent me off onto my way, off on my way. And when I finally made Atlanta, I pulled in. The circus people were waiting for me. I stepped out of the truck and I collapsed into a coma that I was in for four days. It is amazing if you don't want to die, but the will to survive what your body can endure. And I waited through all the drive, through everything to get to where I was going, to step out of the truck to pass out and go right to a coma. It could have happened any time on the highway. When I came out of the coma, apparently I was expected to die and they had called my parents. And when I came out of the coma, my mother and my father were there. They didn't say, I told you! They didn't do any of that. They didn't say anything. They just said, are you all right? And I said, I was fine. After another week, I got out of the hospital. My mother flew back to California. And my dad and I drove a truck and trailer across the United States. And we went fishing. And we talked. And we talked. And we talked. About everything except what happened. And I waited all this time for him to say, I told you. I told you. And he never did that. And I respected and admired him for that. Like he can't believe. We got back to California. I sold the truck. I sold the trailer. And I went back to school. So, why do I tell you this? What, va what value? What value is this to you? The value is in your heart, in your mind. You know right from wrong. How can so many people let this go down and do nothing? And I was so prepared to hate. I wanted to hate everybody. I wanted to hate all of you. I would blame you. I blame your mothers. I blame your fathers. I blame your grandfathers, your great grandfather. You're all guilty. And you know what? None of you are guilty. None of you have anything to do with it. It's not your problem. It's not your word. It's not your love. Because the people at the petrol station were an old and white couple who never asked who did it or anything. They just immediately came to my help, helped fix me up, didn't interrogate me or anything like that, and took care of me and let me go. I assume that if you saw an animal on the side of the road that is hurt, that you would yeah, help it. But some people don't seem to equate that with another human being. <coughs> In your mind, you say, well, that's only in America. I know about that in Compton and drive-by shootings and all that sort of stuff, but we're in Australia, so we're safe and everything's okay and that's fine and so 
So let's go to 1993 to Queensland to town Townsville. Louis Johnson, young Aboriginal boy. Lives out in the country just like you did. Walked home one night after a party, feeling a bit giddy, having a good night. Walked home one K, just like you guys would around here, never give a second thought. And his car comes along with a bunch of people in it, five people in it. They're going, hey, Abba, hey, you little blackie, get stuck, and they throw a glass bottle at him. And he refused to respond. He kept his head down, and he kept walking, and he kept walking, and they kept calling him names, and he kept walking. And finally, it just got to him. He just couldn't stand it anymore. And he said, get stuck. And the guy in the car said, how dare you talk to me like that? And they pulled that car over to the side. And all five of them got out. And they proceeded to beat the crap out of him. And putting their feet in his face. And kicking him in the drawer. And on the side, and in the stomach, and on the cage. On the rib cage. Then they laughed and got in their car after he was completely knocked out and drove off and left him. Some good Samaritan drags him to the side of the road. Good Samaritan. Like I said before, if you saw an animal hurt on the side of the road, would you just drag it to the side of the road and leave it? No, you do something about it. But for this human being, they didn't. They just drag it to the side of the road. Good Samaritan, maybe. Won't get you through the pearly gates, I'll tell you what. As he's starting to set up and recuperate about 15 minutes later, our friends, in the meantime, had gone to a liquor store. And they purchased more liquor. And now, they're driving back down past the scene of the crime <coughs> when they see Louis sitting there shaking his head, trying to get himself together, trying to stand up. And they pulled over, and they proceeded to bash him again. And as Louis is standing like this, trying to get up, the guy came up just like a footy and went, BAM! And knocked him right off one to the other side. And the other guy came running over with all of his speed and went, yeah! Then they dragged him out to the middle of the road. And they set him there. And they all got to their car. And they backed the car up. And they put it in gear. And they drove. And they drove over him. And as they drove over him, they went bong, bong, because apparently that's what it sounds like when you drive over an Aboriginal. Did you know that? Bong, bong. Well, I ask you, what do you sound like when someone drives over your ass? Bong, bong. That's what you sound like. Could the story not end here? No. They call St. John Ambulance Service. It arrives. Here's his child, child, a young <coughs> man, a child, lying in the middle of the road. <coughs> the ambulance driver gets out, he walks over with his hands, very casually over. He leans up and looks down and goes, it's Ernie, the petrol sniffer. <laughs> Come on, son. And they just reach down and they pick him up. <coughs> He was driven over by a car. Picked him up. Took him over and put him in the ambulance. They didn't lay him out on the sheet because he'd get the sheet over there. They'd have to change it. So they set him in, in the seat, drove him to his adopted parents, that's who incidentally were a lovely white couple from somewhere in England who, who uh, immigrated here to Australia, who didn't care what the child was except that it was their child. Dropped him up at home, walked him up 18, 16, 18 stairs, laid him down on the bed and left him. 45 minutes later, his adopted mother comes home and she heard this, this moaning. And when she came upstairs, she found him, he had bloated from internal injuries. The blood had just built up inside of his body. He had bloated. And you couldn't even recognize his face. But thank God that the mother knows her own child. They called an ambulance. It came. This time they put him in the back on a stretcher. They're racing him to Townsville Medical Center. Do you ever see it? They cross.
cars on the other side of the road, and that old, doo -doo -doo, they're racing. They're hooking him up. They've got IVs in him. They're monitoring his heart. Beep, beep, beep. Doo -doo -doo. It's all on for young and old. I always wonder what goes on inside there. Now I know what goes on inside there. They're trying to save his life. They're racing for time. Right there. Right there. It says Townsville Medical Center. Emergency entrance.
You are wonderful. If you need to hear that, get a tape or put it on a loop and listen to it. But better than that, do something with your life. Ladies, don't settle for second best. Don't settle with being a nigger. You don't got to be. Get up, go into the world, and kick some butt. Some serious, serious butt. Gentlemen, I extend the same thing to you. Go out there <coughs> and do it. And do it as a team. Do it with respect. Reach for your goals. Believe in yourself. I can only say that over and over. Believe in yourself. Search for knowledge. Take knowledge on. The key to life and the key to success is knowledge. You want a fancy car? You want to drive a Porsche? You want a big house? You want a yacht? You want to travel around the world? You want to teach? You want to, you want to, you want to. How do I get there? Success is how you get there. If that's what you want, if you want a fancy car, if you want to be successful, then all you've got to do is work hard and go in that direction, and everybody in this room can drive a Ferrari. Everybody in this room can have a Rolls Royce. Everybody in this room can have a house on top of a mountain. Everybody can have it, and if you already got that, well then you're blessed. Because most people don't have that. So what that means for you is I expect you to have three more. Now you're laughing. That means you aren't going to get a Ferrari because you think it's a joke. So you'd be happy in your Volkswagen because I don't care. I can only give to you. You don't want to take it, don't take it. You can take a horse to water. You cannot make a horse. That's right. I can lead you here. I can give you the information. You can leave it there and walk out. And what that means is I've wasted your time, and for that, I apologize. And the other side of it is, maybe there'll be a grain of information here. Maybe I've touched your heart and your soul enough that when you walk out of here tonight, in the privacy of your own brain, go through what I talked about. <coughs> I'm not here for your pity. Do not feel sorry for me. <coughs> I'm not interested in your pity. That happened to me, I've dealt with that. That's over in my life. I'm here to extend knowledge to you. To give it to you. You may take it. I want you to know, I believe in you. And I barely even know you, but I believe in you. I feel this spirit. I feel this energy. I feel this power. I feel it. Do you know what's there? I don't know whether you know what's there or not. And there's nothing I can do. I, sometimes I just want to go down and grab each of you and say, Wake up! But then you think I was a madman. So this is my form. This is how I do it. This is my way of saying, Wake up! Don't wait till you're 25 or 26 and go, Oh, I should have gone to school. I should have worked it out. My life is a bummer. I don't want to hear this. I'm telling you right now, while you got time, deal with it. <coughs> don't give me a sock story at 25 if I'd only know. You know. <coughs> so you gotta write a whole new excuse if, if, if that's the direction you're going to. I know you've been through it, and to get there, you know. You need your mind and you need your soul. Love down is here, and you'll be living. Your life like a king who sets high, and for once in your life, you better put up a fight. Show them who's right, and never say die. Cause this time you know right. I'm gonna see you all. I'm gonna see you yeah. I'm gonna see you all. I'll see every one of you in Love Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.
believe? Yes. Do you believe? Yes. Well, convince yourself. I'm already convinced. <laughs> All right, can we just try this little exercise, please? It's a little vocalizing. <laughs> right, how do you say? It's a little bit of vocal. Pop it your head. Class. <laughs> All right, ready? Just add to that for
I'm very proud of you that someone is asking. Usually what happens is, like you say, I ask you a question and nobody asks you. Because you know what happens when you walk out and everybody walks by and goes, Oh, that was the stupidest question you could have asked. <laughs> That's why we didn't ask you. We just stupid, boy. <laughs> so feel free to ask questions. I never embarrass you. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to be lovely, but I'll keep it in the family. Four boys. I'm five. <laughs> boys. Sometimes I act like I'm five. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, did you want to join the Ross? Yes, I did. Were you one of us burned? I was the one with a nice figure for my butt blew out. I was Diana Ross's bodyguard. And I worked with her for seven years. I worked with her after the Supremes, when she left the Supremes. What kind of stuff did you do? How did you know that? Ah. What, what was your question? I had a Ford, I had a Ford Bronco. Smoked window. <laughs> it said, hey, hey. Oh, okay. No. Anybody else? Yes. You better think of something now. <laughs> if you look at his face, you see his face. Y'all too good for me. You, you heard everything. I passed the paper. Let's test it. Get ready for the big test. Go ahead, sister. Um, so why did you make the same decision to go back to school when you started? Well, when I came out of Roma, I was a bit uh, turned off by the circus and the lifestyle and all that sort of stuff, you know. And I can't figure out why, but just uh, something happened to me. 28, 48 hours before, they just got to put me up and on. It shouldn't be so sarcastic. I just decided at that point that that um, I was very thankful to be alive. I kind of thought that, for a minute, I thought maybe the whole world was like that. Maybe the whole world is full of people like that. And uh, I didn't want to experience that anymore yesterday. I have to know a story about It was on hard copy, and I have a video to set of it, and I've written the walk this follow up. That's how it is. Can I leave you with a little thought here? My daddy once told me the two things that I heard this time. The first I told my grandma told me. My grandma told me that you are born alone. I don't care how popular how popular you become during your life, that when you die, you die alone. And all your friends are not going to get to that casket with you, boy. We're coming. <laughs> they have to, you know what I'm saying? That's one, that's one philosophy, which means that you stand your ground and you be responsible for the ground that you walk on. The second thing that my daddy told me is my daddy said, you are a nigger. You were born a nigger, you will live as a nigger, and you will die as a nigger. And if anybody's got a problem with that, get over it. So my answer to you, or my word to you, is that you are a, a nigger, a dago, a wop, a wall, a slug head, an abo, and anybody else that I forgot to insult, all the white people, Pancake. <laughs> Black, white, and pasty. <laughs> Whatever you are in your life, be a good one. I'm very proud to be a nigger. You know what? It's just a word. If someone ever comes up to you and says, you're heir, but you just smile at me and look at me like a, a, an idiot. <laughs> And I say to you, anytime anybody ever comes up to you and says, you are a nigger, you are a dada, you are a dada, you just smile at them and know that they're stupid. <laughs> and you know what will happen? They will get furious. I call him a nigger and he didn't even get that! <laughs> How dare he not get that when I call him a nigger? And I'm sitting there going, <laughs>
have to find a, a new a new avenue, a new way to talk because just calling me names is like, yeah, well, I am a nigga, get over it. Yeah, I am a walk, get over it. It was the voices of these young people singing as they do almost every day of the week. In Zambia, if you work, you sing. I came back to Australia and said to our Baptist churches, it would be fantastic if this choir of young people could come and visit us. Now, they live in an African village. They've got no idea of the Western world. Just think what it was like when they were in the jumbo jet Coming. Okay. And they arrived at Perth International Airport and they saw for the first time the ocean. Yesterday, they rolled their sleeves up and put the foot into the waves of the beaches around here. They're going to come and seek you now in their, their own national tongue. I'll let you listen to this. They come.
education in Zambia <coughs> is very limited. Only a very small percentage of the children of Zambia have the opportunity for education. For these young people, I think some have got up to as high as grade nine, but they've been up to ages 24 or 25 before they've reached that level. At Pawali Hill, where this choir comes from, this is just half the choir from the church, the Baptist church at Pawali Hill. Things are going great over there. These are a Christian group of young people. And because missionaries, I think you've heard the fact that missionaries go out to other countries. And our missionaries haven't gone out there to change their culture. All they've done is to encourage them to have a faith in Jesus Christ. Crispin, would you like now to sing a song? You either explain it in lumber or you sing it in English. You come and tell these people what you're going to do. <coughs> The song which we sing is saying, uh, through singing we are preaching Jesus. Through singing we are proclaiming the gospel. people 
going away overseas, they heard the magic of this song. They'll sing this one in English. And I think it's telling us they have a song that they want to celebrate together. Thank you, sister. Oh, before you start on that, <laughs> let me say this. Last Friday afternoon, on the Midday Show, and on Darren Pinch's Midday Show, we had advised earlier that the choir was coming. Now, Christian choirs are not usually welcome on television. Now, I guess if, if I said to any of you, would you come to church with me next Sunday, you know what you'd expect. And you say, no dear, that's not, not my thing. When you see the way these young people sing and really have feeling about what they're there for, why they go to church, you'll notice the difference. Darren Hinch came up to me afterwards and said, it was a privilege to have this choir on my show. And this is what they said. <laughs>
What, what about uh, education, uh, Jansen? Um, uh, what's the opportunity for kids who actually get to school and what are the <coughs> employment opportunities that might come? Uh, education is a very big problem in, in Zambia because we don't have a free education. Uh, parents have to pay a certain amount of money uh, to the ministry so that uh, a person can, can continue school. And uh, some of these young men are privileged. <coughs> some have gone, uh, some are still at school and some have finished school. And a few of them are working. But in, uh, in other villages, those who are unable to have enough money, some don't even go to school, some just up, uh, end up to grade seven. And the uh, employment situation, that is a very big problem because we have got so little jobs in, uh, in Zambia and uh, a, a, a graduate would finish his education but there's no employment and there's nowhere he can go and be employed. As a result, that discourages a lot of young men and women. Jackson, we are aware of Rwanda and the tragedy of that is. Now, I understand the Rwandans have had to flee across into Zaire, but I just say that Zambia also is a neighbor of Zaire. So these people are just south of that Rwanda area. It looks like there's going to be a drought in this coming year, and Zambia could be severely hit as it was about two and a half years ago. So for you, for you to come to Australia and to see everything we've got here, what does it do to you? How, how do you respond to what you see here in Australia? Uh, well, my response to uh, what I've seen here in Australia, uh, we haven't got much, as uh, rather can I say, and you've got just too much. I've been in, uh, in some of, uh, your homes, I found that one family can have two to three cars and a boat. <laughs> you see, we don't have such things. Well, there are a few people who own cars, some are wealthy, but not as you are. I, uh, I would say you have a more luxury life than we, we do have. But there's, da there's danger. Right? What I've noticed, people have, uh, they know that, you know, they've got everything and they've forgotten their creator. Yes. That's the sad part of it. No, Some Australians uh, well, no, who are very wise, well, they don't think of God. No, they I think it's it. all right because they've got it. They are all packaged. They've got everything. But the truth is they are empty because they haven't got the Lord Jesus Christ Hallelujah. in their lives. Has anyone got a question to ask you? Well, Kenny is on the phone. <laughs> Anyone has a question? Yes, my friend. On Zambia, um, or like where you live, and um, like Christians? Yes, I would say some are not Christians, but most of the community there in 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 Zambia are Christians. They love the Lord. Oh yes, my friend. I'm not going to be spending the phone. Sorry. I will be spending the phone. We will be in Australia for five weeks. Sorry. How long have you been singing for together? Oh, I see. When we started the <laughs> Well, I'm the founder of this choir. It started in 1975. say Christianity was the first uh, region we had because it came with Do uh, Dr. Livingstone, David Livingstone. Yeah, I think we had Christianity. Yeah, even though uh, uh, some Africans didn't know about God, they worshipped other things, which was not, uh, which was very bad because uh, we have got only one God and we cannot worship anything else. Yes, my dear? Do many Africans still worship? Uh, yes, I would say in some parts of Africa, but uh, most Zambians have known the true living God. Even though there are so many denominations, 
but they know there is one true God and that's the one they worship. But before they worshiped spirits of their ancestors, but now it's changing because uh, like in our association we've got church planters, they go and uh, uh, church planters, what I actually mean, people start up new churches, so there is the word of God nearly everywhere in Zambia. <coughs> and the president of Zambia is a Christian. Yes. And, and they are finding, when you have a leadership that has something you can trust in, it changes the nation. I think we've almost run out of time. Uh, one more question. Have you been with the groups in Botswana? Yes. Sometimes I work in a, in a rural health centre. Sometimes I'm very busy with the laboratory work and I'm not usually with the group, but there are times when I'm with the group. How many years ago was it you started singing with the group? Uh, 1975. And you're still a young person. Singing is a way of life. Okay. One more question like this one. Oh, another question. Yes, a lot of our music we, we dance, we do drills, different ones. Yes. All right. And perhaps they'll, we'll need to perhaps go outside now. And Crispin, a song which has got a little bit more of you know, the, the rhythm and. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they don't rock and roll, but it's just when they sing, they mean what they sing, and their whole body wants to express what they mean. So we thank you, you've been incredible this year. And uh, before they go, what say you show your appreciation for? Translation for your song? Oh, yes. Uh, he's saying that come and worship the Almighty God.
Dentro do que não meti. Do you like doing? Yeah. Do you like shaking somebody's hand? Yeah. <laughs> do these people make you nervous at all? Yes. They do make you nervous? Yes. yes. <laughs> They're all very curious. <laughs> yeah. They're not all that hostile. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? I know. Yeah, just taking to this one. Just walking out. In my heart, in my heart, in my soul, I have put Jesus in my heart.
They've come at the invitation of the Baptist Churches of Australia because missionaries went out there and shared the love of God with them. Just one second, I'm speaking on. Hold the line, please. So, we're pleased that they want to sing one more song for you so that you'll understand. Are you singing in Lumber or English? Lumber. Lumber is their national country. Now, for them to come to Australia here, is an incredible cultural shock. They've come from an African village, but one thing they've enjoyed about Australia is McDonald's. <laughs> and yesterday, for the first time ever, they experienced the ocean and the waves. They put their foot in the water, then their knees, and their clothes on, they went under. And they loved it, so we're going to take them to a surf beach. They're going to sing one more song now, and we're going to the other side. Oh, 